Okay, so normally I like to review these ancient DOS games in their sequel order. For example, when I get around to Duke Nukem, I'll review the first game first, the second game second, and the third game third. But I decided to take a look at the second King's Quest game first for a variety of reasons. Rest assured, I'll get to both DOS versions of the first game eventually, but for now, we're taking a look at King's Quest II, Romancing the Throne. At its most basic level, King's Quest II is essentially a graphical inventory-based adventure and text adventure all rolled into one, meaning you walk around to where you want to go, then type in what it is you want to do. It's an interesting format that was used in a massive number of Sierra titles, but now I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's get the game stats out of the way. King's Quest II was originally created and released by Sierra Online at the start of 1985. It's a one-player inventory-based adventure game featuring multiple graphics modes and support for both PC speaker and Tandy 3 voice sound. I recommend playing the game in its Tandy 320x216 color graphics mode because this is the only way to enable the Tandy 3 voice sound support, which sounds many times better than the PC speaker. As for its release date, the original has always remained commercial, and it's incredibly easy to find, especially with the good old game's website at www.gog.com offering the first three King's Quest games together as a digital download for $10. Or you can check places like eBay and find the King's Quest collection discs for about the same amount. However, a company by the name of Anonymous Game Developers Interactive, also known as AGD, which is a really similar acronym to my own, released a modernized fan remake with permission from Sierra in 2002. And it's still very much available from their website at www.agdinteractive.com. Story is fairly simple. Following the events of the first King's Quest game, King Graham of the Kingdom of Daventry has grown lonely ruling the kingdom on his own, and seeks a maiden to become his queen and to provide an heir to the throne. Not knowing what to do, he consults the Magic Mirror, one of the three treasures of the kingdom, which shows him a beautiful woman in a quartz tower beyond the nearby land of Kalima. Knowing what these images must mean, King Graham once again dons his feathered cap and sets off on his quest. Playing the King's Quest games generally boils down to the simple process of walking where you want to go using the numeric keypad and typing in the exact actions you want to perform. The game's command interpreter is actually fairly well designed and can usually recognize subtle differences in the way you type things, such as when you find a hollow log and you can either type in look at log or look inside log and get different results. As long as you keep the things you say simple and refer to things either by their most basic form or their actual names, you shouldn't run into any issues. You do have a score at the top of the screen, which culminates based on the actions you perform and your solutions to various problems as some of the puzzles have more than one solution. Though you need to be careful because it is possible to end up in what's referred to as a walking dead situation, where you've messed up certain events to the point where you can't recover and thus cannot beat the game. A good example of this is when you get the flying carpet and ride it into the clouds. You can only ride the carpet twice, once to get up and once to get back, so heading back before doing everything you can will make the game unbeatable, forcing you to restart from the beginning. Fortunately, there's not much of that in this game, and in fact overall King's Quest 2 is very linear compared to the original. You see, many of the things you can do in this game you aren't actually allowed to do until certain other things have been done first. In the original King's Quest, you had three treasures you had to acquire, but you could acquire them in any order so long as you had the necessary items to succeed. Here, you're pretty much forced to go through a sequence of key events in order, each triggered by reading the inscriptions of a set of magical doors across a rickety bridge. Now, this bridge is another good example of Walking Dead 2, because if you cross it just one more time than is absolutely necessary, it'll break before you can unlock and walk through the final magical door. Like with the first King's Quest game, you'll also see a bunch of references from fairy tales and such, including Little Red Riding Hood and Dracula, of all things. I mean seriously, what in the world is Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother doing with a cape and ring that both belong to Count Dracula? In fact, do I really want to know how she got them in the first place? Probably not. The one thing I've always found neat about these AGI games from Sierra is that when you look at items in your inventory, you get a little picture of them at the bottom of the screen. So even the items you get take on a personality of their own. They're not just plain lines of text. Since this is an inventory-based adventure game and can be beaten in under half an hour if you know exactly what to do, I don't want to drag this review out too long and spoil the game for anyone who wants to try it for themselves. But I do have some tips, which can actually be applied to many of Sierra's AGI titles. My first tip is to make a rough map as you go along of each of the screens you find, keeping in mind that there are loop-around points in the main world across the northern and southern edges. This way you can go back to certain places if you have to, such as a series of magical doors you're trying to unlock. Secondly, try to stay on the edges of the screen when you can. See, there's three different bad guys that can randomly appear in certain areas, including a thieving dwarf, an evil enchanter, and Hagatha the Witch. And if one of them appears, you'll want to walk off the edge of the screen as fast as you can to get them to disappear. 
If the dwarf catches you, he'll steal your treasures and you'll have to raid his treehouse to get them back. If the enchanter catches you, he'll turn you into a frog, effectively ending your quest. If Hagatha catches you, she'll throw you in her cauldron and boil you up for dinner, also effectively ending your quest. Fortunately, there's a fairy that can randomly appear, usually outside of the monastery, who puts a protection spell on you to keep these evildoers from harming you. My last tip is to keep many saves, since it's possible to screw up your quest beyond repair, and if you do end up unable to proceed, your best bet may be to just load a previous game rather than backtrack. You can't actually name all of your save games rather descriptively, so it's usually best to make a note of what you are about to do or what kind of situation you're getting yourself into in the name of the save game itself. I also want to quickly make mention of this game's Hercules monochrome graphics support, because it's one of the best I've ever seen. I mean, it doesn't look at that well thanks to all the video compression going on, but in person this looks incredibly crisp and detailed, and it's really crazy that they're pulling off this level of detail using only black and white, no shades of grey. Even the font has greater resolution and definition than in the other supported graphics modes. One curious thing too is that the unusual resolution of the Hercules display doesn't allow room for the command interpreter, so when you want to do something, the game will actually pause and show the command interpreter in the middle of the screen. This means you can't type things in ahead of time like usual and have to wait until the exact moment you want to do something before you can even begin to type in the action you want to perform. So yeah, short review of King's Quest 2, since I don't want to spoil it too much. It's not the best in this series, but there's certainly been worse, and it's still a fun game that anyone could beat without a walkthrough given enough time and effort. DOS box settings are pretty simple too. Just leave the cycle set to auto, set the machine type to Tandy, and you're good to go. There is joystick support as well, but considering the amount of typing you have to do, it's pretty impractical, and only really there for PC Junior users, since they didn't get a numeric keypad for movement. Anywho, that's all for this episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week is episode 50, the first season finale, and I've got quite the episode planned that isn't going to focus on any one specific game, so make sure you tune in next Saturday to see what I've got in store.